Hello friends, so we are fresh off of the Diablo 4 update stream where they covered a lot about season progression and battle pass progression. So while I just want to get like a really slim down, cut down video from this, I ended up talking with Teo on stream as we were going over the different points. And I think that the conversation actually lends some additional context and some value to it, not just going over very specifically what they said, but more so what it means for the game, what we can expect, you know, what kind of effect this will have on seasons, etc. So I am going to have timestamps down to everything below. You can go look there if you just want to see the individual topics. Um, this isn't a complete list of literally every single thing that they absolutely confirmed this will happen. It more so touches on all the big topics, what I think were actually important to get out of the dev stream and things that I personally walked away with either learning something new, getting confirmation on something that I thought was incredibly important, or more context to be able to better discuss any of these endgame systems that people may have missed. So if you're looking for something like that, you found the right video. I'm not going to waste any more of your time. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you at the end. So mid to late July for season one. So, right? so I'm going to take that as late July, kind of right off the bat. Are they always going to try to hit one. that, or is that like, hmm, the first week of the first season might be absolutely scuffed and we actually start on the first weekend of every season usually? Right, Or will there yeah. be some variance there? Like, we'll see. I, I put that late July, depending on how it goes. So, third, third weekend of July, maybe? And we have to remember they're probably doing, like, Thursday rollouts as well for the, like, worldwide rollout time. So I'm going to say that, man. third third week of July. Yeah, man, just get a bigger player base than the United States or uh, well, sorry for the Americas or Asia and, and we'll, we'll get right over there. Europe, you know, Europe is going to trump the D the, the NA player base <laughs> no on, way, on lunch. No way. So then we have four seasons per year, which is like a pretty tight deadline. I think. I think that that's brave of them to say. Three well, months three, seasons. Three month seasons, which they have promised before in other games, which they didn't deliver, so won't come. But Diablo 4 is actually the game that actually has a team that actually is going to see support. Like, this is the reason why the other ones haven't been getting support, right? Is because Diablo 4 has been in development. And they're really trying to own the ARPG space, right? They're, they're trying to pick up ground on PoE before PoE 2. They're trying to regain people from things like Last Epoch and Torchlight. Like, they, they, they yeah. want this to be a W. So I think they, they're going to they, commit to it. I think it's just aggressive. They will still have a hard time competing with PoE's update scale, like the, the sure. amount of updates that they are doing. I, well, it's I, also I don't see that. Well, it's also because PoE, PoE answers to itself, right? So PoE can say, hey, we threw it out there and it was half of it worked. Sorry, guys, we're working on it. Like they can do that. Blizzard can't do that. So what it ultimately means is the things that we get should be cleaner. But yes, we're going to get less things, right? Uh, seasonal quest line. Again, this is something that they had already talked about, but you have it's not going to expand the primary campaign story. They only want to expand the primary campaign story in expansions, uh, but they want it to explain the theme. They want it to explain why we have new powers or new mechanics. They want to tell like in interest stories. So a story that makes sense within the world and it might have plot ramifications, but it's not going to push the, the overarching narrative of the game franchise forward in a way like an expansion would or a game release would, which I really like. Thing that was kind of interesting, I think Joe Papora said it there. Oh, he like specifically said like, we still want you to be able to take big roles in the story of the season. And he like specifically called out like, we would still like you to be able to take on the role of something like the Wanderer, which to me, I don't know how you accomplish that if you're not pushing the story of the world forward. Like, I don't know how you can be the Wanderer in a campaign or in a seasonal story that doesn't push the campaign forward so maybe it reveals information or maybe it touches stuff on the books or maybe it's stuff that people should know from other games but it's not new information do you know what i mean like but mostly the quest line is just going to be there to explain why this new aspect exists or why this 
new slot in your gear exists, whatever it is. <laughs> We're going to be learning about season one post game launch as far as like theming and potential in game um, like in game story or, or just like the overall idea or like new system that will be introduced. I can't imagine. I don't know. Do you think it's going to be a big new system introduced or do you think it's just going to be some new stuff in the current systems that we already have i think like thematically this the, the first season will probably the be the closest to what we start with uh, game wise um i don't expect anything massive to be there but actually hmm, you could see it two ways either it's not going to be massive because it's going to be too close to what we start with on the game or it's going to be super massive to kind of set expectations and get people hyped about seasons like right. I, I can see both even if the first season's theme was just like the world of sanctuary is is waking up to whatever the campaign quest line is like i i see season one's theme being the ramifications of the campaign story makes sense to me you know whether it's whatever we end up doing with lilith and anarius like we're gonna play the whole campaign before the season so season one being here's how the world looks because you did that makes sense to me without it being like expansion level kind of you know story dump that would be cool talking about seasons rod ferguson made it very clear season one will not have a leaderboard and potentially even season two will not have leaderboards how are we feeling about that because i'm i'm upset i'm let down I, I, think, it's... I agree i think it sucks i get it because here's, here's what I hear. When they say season one won't even have like a level 100 at the very least leaderboard, that means they didn't come up with or, or what they have is not fully formed and they feel like it would do worse to just throw it in. I hear them being apprehensive about wanting to put, you know, broken stuff into the game and I appreciate that, but it still sucks. Yeah, for me, it's like, um, I, I'd rather see something actually fleshed out and finished before they put it in. Like, I, I hate it when something is incomplete or terrible. I mean, PoE, I usually skip the first week of using this, uh, the, the season mechanics on Diablo. I was like, hmm, I, I personally want to have something that is fleshed out before it gets shipped. Therefore, I am fine with that kind of thinking. But I'm still disappointed that it will be maybe season three. They talked about kind of what to expect from seasons. None of this is new, but they did clarify one important thing, which I think is really important here. So, you know, seasons are going to introduce new mechanics, new uh, ways that skills work together, new uh, paragon or new codex of power abilities, meaning new aspects, right? So that like literally just changes how skills work and, and what your gear looks like. But they're going to retire the new mechanics at the end of the season and it won't flood into non-season. We kind of touched on it while it was happening, but you know, like the codex of power, I assume you just have that now. So starting up the next season, you'll be able to use that power. But let's say, I don't know, there was like a special new key that you could put into the, the Helltide event that made it so that sigil or whatever it is like the mechanics that they put into the season aren't going to trickle into the eternal the eternal realm and it's going to go away at the end of the season so you don't get that poe bloat i'm pretty sure you agree that that's a good thing but well it depends a little bit on what you're looking at if if you say crafting like the other two crafting type of style thing would be a seasonal thing. I think that would be a mechanic that I would love to see continuously being like in the game, Thank you, rather Adrian, than just for the follow for one season. So it really depends on the season theme in one general. Of, one of the things that I found kind of interesting was there's new. You know, we might have a new crafting system, but then if that mechanic goes away, what happens to the items? You know, do the items just rotate into? Like kind of like rumor, like do they just rotate in and then you won't be able to do that type of crafting again in the next season? That's the only thing where I get kind of like, well, what do you well, mean? It, it will just end up in the eternal realm. It's similar to, I, I'm going to presume it's going to be similar to how Diablo 2 at the early stages, they had the like 108 Shaco and 108 yeah. uh, Ariats, etc. 
that they will exist in the eternal realm, how they call it now. Um, and yeah, they will just be there and you, you may be able to get them through trading. Maybe, maybe not. One of my, so one of my problems with that is right now to be able to craft an item it binds it to your account all all forms of crafting that we know other than yeah socketing i think maybe if it binds it to your account you are creating a scarcity in people who do and do not have that stuff now that can be a motivator to play the season but i think a lot of people get angry when they feel like they have to play a season if they're not somebody who normally does. Now, I do think that that is a vast minority, and I think that they're mad about nothing, actually, if I'm going to be honest with you, because just play the season. But that does mean, you know, if it turns out that there was like a super broken craft and I dumped millions and millions and millions of gold to like perfectly roll an item and then I got the proper hit on the new crafting system. Now I'm the only necromancer with that helmet slot item with that ability on it, which is difficult to balance around that that creates another space where it's hard to balance around itemization you know they uh, i don't i don't want to slippery slope this i don't want to be like joe purpura officially said crafting you have to play season to be able to pvp in in eternal realm you know what i mean like i don't think it, it has the potential of that i don't think we've actually seen anything that means like yes this is a problem yes it needs to be addressed but that is that's one of the concerns that i have when i hear something like that oh first off let's let's stop here right Let's talk about this. One, uh, here you get caches. So these are things that you're typically getting from quests. So a specific cache. And then you have the aspect, right? So seasonal journey mm -hmm. giving you specific codex of power aspects. That's really cool. And then the type of stuff that you do. So collect gallow vine, complete a dungeon, complete a local event. This makes sense for like chapter one, key of shad, region, etc. Favor is the XP for the battle pass, free or paid. No, that, that? no, no. Oh, no. The oh, ashes the XP. are for the the XP. Uh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. To push the battle pass forward. Gotcha. Okay, yes. perfect. So here, here was the actual battle pass section. In the battle pass, again, top secret. You can totally see stuff over here. Somebody, somebody, get on that. Somebody, CSI, enhance and zoom this. But I wanted to touch on this because even though they, I feel like they went over it very clearly, some people are getting confused. Here's the track. As you can see, you have XP bars in each section. That's you getting the large favor tokens and getting through here. This is the, here you go. This is the freemium currency right here. And you unlock things. You'll see that the ashes, ashes are what you use to get yourself miniature bonuses. They are calling them blessings. Here's one thing. They talk about the blessings being for XP boosts, but they have revealed that there are four other types of boosts. I really like them, but we just, I don't think that we had seen them previously. Nope. And then the ashes themselves, which are also on the free track, see how they say free, but they only unlock at certain levels reached on your highest level character. So not only do you need to unlock uh, enough battle pass experience to get up to them, but also be high enough level to gain them once you have these ashes you could then buy xp boost yeah. right which i will didn't make, see that number in the middle i'm sorry which will make getting to level 20 faster but this is all on the free track and you can't just buy them all so like if you buy the premium battle pass you'll unlock all these levels but you still need to hit level 10 you still need to hit level 20 to be able to actually get the blessings and the blessings are the things that have in-game power ramifications everything else is a cosmetic uh, a mount skin or currency for the shop and the shop is only cosmetics i mean we can go into the blessings a little bit more it's like you have the experience one so experience promotes a kill so it's not like generally speaking you get more experience um starting at 3% XP and costs one ash. So I'm going to presume that the later stages are costing more. The second one is gold from selling items to vendors, which what up, is going to be you. nice to have that extra bonus gold to yep. respect. Oh, especially. absolutely. <laughs> Rare materials from salvage. I'm not sure how impactful that's going to be long term. Probably well, not too much. That could. So right now, like one of the problems that you run into, right, is 
from what we can read in game, you need to salvage unique items to upgrade unique items. You need to salvage legendary items to upgrade legendary items. So you might really early on, you might hit a point where you're like, I only have gotten two unique items. I want to use one. I'll salvage the other one. I can now upgrade this once. OK, I can't fully upgrade it, but maybe I get double them. So now I can upgrade twice per item as opposed to once per item. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see what that's like. Boost to the duration of elixirs is really awesome. So if people didn't see it in game, uh, buying elixirs gave you an XP boost. I think it was 3% experience. And they lasted for a half hour. So you could take all of your like gallo vine and whatever and buy the cheapest elixir there. It would still give you the 3% experience for the 30 minutes. So boosting the duration, if it's 15% per level, as you can see right here, next level 15%. Let's say in total it's 60%. That means roughly 20 extra minutes on an elixir. So now an elixir is close to an hour as opposed to just 30 minutes. So now you have like a full hour of, you know, mega farming for, for power leveling. In addition to being able to level up your pure XP gain from monster kills. But I like this. XP boosts, extra gold from vendor sales, rare materials, elixir duration these are all the things you i typically expect to see where it's like yes you get to play the game more efficiently yes it's a bonus you have to make decisions on what you prioritize but now the the pure grinding just to get enough gold and pure grinding just to get enough materials and pure grinding just to get your next character up to level 100 is faster and i like that there are 90 tiers to the battle pass and they consider it to be achievable for most people within the, the three month period that makes sense to me and then for other things they said that they're just you know they're looking to incorporate feedback but not to necessarily expect that feedback to go into effect season like the next season like if it's something that they legitimately want to implement it may be a season or two down the road i think that makes complete sense although since they have a live service team They'll obviously be answering any like game breaking bu bugs or, you know, broken quest lines or stuff like that. But if it's like, oh, hey, this skill with this stuff was too strong, we probably won't see that, you know, you know brought back into balance for a season or two. They want us to have aspirational challenges during the season. So not only just like doing the gear progression, which they do think is like realistically your power progression is the key feature of the game outside of PvP but having aspirational challenges like new major world encounters, world bosses, uh, specific dungeon challenges to actually test how strong or, or how much progression you've made. And that that will be used for testing new in-game features for future seasons and expansions. I think that's smart. Why not just use us to QA every cool new thing? Absolutely. And then that's, that's all I really picked out of there that I thought people should really could really walk away understanding. Did you have other notes? You only have to unlock the mod once per account. I'm not sure if that was fully transparent yet. I thought you had to get that at least once per season, but maybe I missed some information at some point. Uh, my, my understanding is things like that were unlocked permanently, but you still had to do it hardcore versus softcore. Like you, yes, I, I saw yeah, somebody yeah. go, oh, you do it one time. Well, you do it one time uh, on hardcore and one twice. time on softcore. Yeah. One of the other interesting things about about hardcore in particular is, yes, you lose your gear. Like, they didn't say anything about somebody being able to pick up your gear. Yeah, this is uh, going to be like Diablo 3, not Diablo 2, where you can tell people you can pick up my gear. Yeah. Um, but stashes are all shared stashes. So you can yep. already just put stuff away. All your currency is shared across your account, so you can already put all that stuff away. So you lose that character. You basically lose the time you put into only playing that character, but it doesn't... You're not destitute. You know what I mean? It's, it's an improvement, actually, to Diablo 3, where you are losing your Paragon points, basically, quote-unquote, because you're have to re-level your character in, in Diablo 3 you were keeping your Paragon as well which is a good thing <laughs> like you actually like your, your character actually matters you lose the gear your character was wearing 
which is probably your best stuff, but you're not now unable to play the season, which big, I guess big, for people... Big, big note for every hardcore player, you should not play with your best gear unless you're pushing the night engines. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, which basically doubles like your gear progression time in hardcore, which is kind of cool. You know, literally just have more stuff to do and care about for people who like hardcore. You know, savages, of course. You know, but season I, two, I'm going to play hardcore. Oh, yeah, sure. Why not? I'll, I mean, like, I'll play hardcore too, right? So I hope that that was insightful or that we picked up on some things that you might have missed and picked up on the more important things. Again, thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that it helps and I hope that you're just excited for the Diablo 4 launch as I am. I can't wait for it and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.